Circus is coming through. Everybody knows that when you purchase a ticket, you expect to get a show. All right, uh, welcome to our show today. It's not exactly the nose, but it's not exactly not the nose. Uh, we are going to focus on stand up comedy, on stand up comedy specials. In particular, uh, we are going to do this with two people who have very uh, close experiences uh, to that. Sean Murray is a stand-up comedian, writer, and the host of the Nobody Asks Sean, S-H-A-W-N. I always spell it so you can find it more easily. Nobody Asks Sean podcast. Uh, Jason Zinneman is a critic at large for the New York Times, where he writes the On Comedy column. Um, and we're going to run through a lot of different names here. Some of them will be well-known to you. Uh, others will be maybe less well-known, depending on how much attention you pay to all this. Uh, but I think what we're going to do is start with two of the biggest names in comedy right now who, over the course of the end of the year, uh, put out um, Netflix specials. One of them is Ricky Gervais, who dropped Armageddon uh, on December 25th. Dave Chappelle then dropped The Dreamer um, on December 31st. Not the first time he's dropped a New Year's Eve special. So, um, Jason, one of the things I think we'll be coming back to again and again during this conversation is – the degree to which comedians do their comedy, but their comedy now contains an awful lot uh, about reactions, reactions on social media, reactions to what they do, attempts to cancel them, uh, death threats against them. This is all part of a lot of the stand-up routines we'll be talking about today. With, with Chappelle and Gervais, it seemed to me a little bit like uh, well, it seemed a little bit like those uh, Christian churches in the South. I think they're sort of out of fashion at this point. But where, and if you've ever seen documentary footage of it, it's kind of extraordinarily where the pastor and other parishioners will pick up rattlesnakes uh, uh, and and or take strychnine. Uh, the the premise being that Jesus is going to protect them, uh, that they can't get hurt. I feel like Gervais and Chappelle are kind of at the point where they're doing really transgressive material. But the message is, yeah, a lot of other people might explode into flames or just, you know, get canceled or something. I'm too big for that because of who I am. I can say all kinds of super transgressive and occasionally offensive stuff. But Jason, I'd love your kind of critics take on that. I uh, Well, I think they're two totally different, um, uh, you know, situations, although I, I would I would question the premise. I mean, it, are, are is what are they doing transgressive uh comedy right now i guess it, what it what makes it transgressive uh at this point um their audiences know exactly what uh they're gonna what they're gonna say they expect them to say uh you know for in Chappelle's case he's been making jokes about you know trans people for seven years um the people who are offended by that don't want to hear it are you know you know are not hearing it and and the people who do want to hear it um you know are, are on board and that's sort of baked in um ricky gervais um is you know what to, to his credit i guess although i think he's less of a he's less of a, a gifted stand-up than Chappelle. you know he says that you know the idea that you can't say something or that you can't say anything anymore which you hear all the time is not true i've said it and nothing happens to me. And um, so uh, I, at this point, I think it's uh, probably best for us to stop saying they're transgressive if they're just pandering to the audience that they already have. I think even the biggest def defenders of these comics wouldn't claim that these last two specials is doing something that is unexpected, that is subverting any kind of... Uh, you know, audience they have. I mean, the, I guess the, the question would be, are, are they pandering to that audience? And, and I would argue, um, you know, yes, there, there, there's many, many, most comedians out there are not obsessed with the backlash to their jokes. Um, these two are. Um, and uh, I think to, so, uh, there's been times certainly where Chappelle has turned that into really fertile, interesting comedy there's something really exciting about this idea of hey i'm not supposed to say this and let me bring the audience into this sort of conspiracy where i'm going to 
going to talk to them in, in, in this about this thing that you're not supposed to say. That's a tried and true method that's been around forever. Nothing new about that. Um, and it can be done very effectively. But um, at this point, I would say both of those specials um, are, are pretty predictable. So, Sean, you know, Chappelle seems to be aiming for a, a particular kind of branding right at the beginning of this special before the credits even roll I think you see him there's sort of uh, this kind of arty looking black and white footage of him backstage a Henry David Thoreau quote appears on the screen and then this uh, kind of minimalist Radiohead song starts playing uh, and and it's a little bit at odds, I think, with the person we eventually see once the special gets going. But it is as though Chappelle's trying to send us some message about who he is. I just lo- love to take your thoughts anywhere they want to go. No, for sure. It, it feels to me like um, I think the worst thing that ever happened in comedy is when comedians started saying comedians are the modern day philosophers, because then like a lot of comedians started believing that they were philosophers like no just because you have a philosophy doesn't make you a philosopher <laughs> like like a lot of the philosophies that i hear in comedy like in a comedy routine are an interesting take but it's like i wouldn't use that as my like philosophy for life and i feel like that's what like dave Chappelle like positions himself as these days where it's like i'm this grand thinker it's like no you had an interesting take on like ja rule like you know what i mean and like celebrity culture and how that like you know you know where is ja great joke and it's, it's an even better joke 20 years later because it's like our culture has become more obsessed with celebrity great joke but it's like i wouldn't like i don't i don't who bases their identity around or like their their lifestyle around a dave chappelle philosophy so then we get to this point where like his last once he got to netflix like the myth of dave chappelle just grew and grew because like the thing is chappelle's first two specials for HBO back in like the early 2000s were great. But Chappelle was never looked at as the great stand-up of his day. It was uh, it was Chris Rock was the guy. Um, following Chris Rock, like Dane Cook was huge, Louis, Kevin Hart, and, you know, and so on. But Chappelle was never the biggest guy in stand-up comedy. Chappelle's show was huge. But then after Chappelle's show ended the way it did, and then he disappeared for all that time, he came back, he had grown, his, his stature as a stand-up has grown. People were waiting to see what he did. And he used that, to like bolster the image of Chappelle as like this amazing guy. He's, he's a great stand-up. I'm, I would never like criticize him like his talent as a stand-up, but it's like you're not this amazing thinker. And when you when you do that, when, when he when he poses somebody like somebody's stuff, it is profound. But it's like that's not what we come to you for. And then sometimes he he does he uses that sort of profound thinker uh, cadence and performance to then do to then undercut it with uh like a a trans joke or something. And it's like, well, you, you're you just using your powers for evil. <laughs> like it just, I don't know, it's, it just feels very like uh, self-obsessed. You know what I mean? Like it's like, I don't know. It's, it's not, it's like, it's, it's not that interesting. Like you're not that interesting as a thinker. And then there's this whole, like he has that Kanye West thing where it's like, like, which like you need that a level of belief to hit that level that Kanye and Chappelle have in their fields. Where like I have to believe in myself and I can do anything. And somebody told me I can't do it. I'm gonna do it just to prove that you told like just to prove that I could do it when you said I couldn't. <laughs> right. So but then it's like maybe you shouldn't have. Yeah. Like, maybe you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. And so one thing that these both of these comics do kind of unbelievably at this point. But I think it maybe gets back to what you were saying, Jason, that, well, they've already kind of dumped their whole bag of tricks onto the stage over and over again in terms of saying stuff you're not supposed to say. But they kind of go back into sort of an old, old kind of that comedy, which is they make fun of disabled people. Uh, both of them have stretches in their show where they make fun of disabled people. For for Chappelle, he's kind of saying, well, I'm not going to do trans people anymore. I'll do disabled people. And that's kind of his joke. But and then it opens the door for, for some kind of seventh grader type uh, jokes about disabled people. Gervais, at one point, makes a really interesting point about the casting of Eddie Redmayne as Stephen Hawking. And, but it's a more of an interesting point than it is funny, which, Jason, I think is a point that you've also made about Chappelle. Occasionally, they have these valid or interesting points to make, but they're almost more interested in that than the basic job of being funny. Well, to, to build on what, uh, you know, um, brought, brought up uh, the Ja Rule joke, uh-huh. um, I think is really just I, I'll answer your question, but this, this is telling because I think it's a good it's a good joke to bring up. After 9-11, in, in Chappelle's best stand-up special, 
for what it's worth. And it's worth looking back at that special to see how great he was. Um, that, you know, he does this joke where CNN after, um, you know, after the, you know, the towers got hit, they they wanted, they, they called up Ja Rule, right? And Chappelle's this whole joke making fun of the idea of asking a celebrity, uh, it, you know, their take on something as important as September 11th. And the line is, you know, his line is, you know, we, we might have need some answers that Ja Rule doesn't have right now, right? <laughs> and it's funny looking back like 20 years later, uh, how quaint that joke looks because in social media, we're constantly looking to celebrities, actors, you know, performers to weigh in on Gaza, on, you know, these, you know, issues about, um, you know, disabled people, et cetera. This is like, it, it's the water in which we swim. And, you know, 20 years ago, it was like, it was exactly what Chappelle was ridiculing. Um, so, you know, to, to your question, no, I don't. Th I, I, it's depressing that we're spending the mo this much time talking about them, to be honest with you. I don't think any, uh, Ricky Gervais intends to or has anything particularly insightful to say about disabled people. He's just trying to, uh, you know, uh, he as you know, I take him at his word. He's just trying to get laughs. Um, and the way he gets laughs is by um, saying things that um, these kind of misdirects about um you know, you know, groups which he thinks will offend people. Chappelle hints at a broader point about in this special about punching down, um, in which he's, you know, he says, I think like satirically, oh, I love punching down, right? And I do think there is something um stupid about a, a certain way of viewing all of comedy that did emerge a few years ago that good comedy and versus bad comedy, you could figure out, you know, whether or not something's punching up or punching down. I think that's far too simplistic and rigid. You can make anything funny. Um, and there's all sorts of examples of, and the other point is this, that one thing that we've really learned over the last couple of years is that people's capacity to play the underdog is limitless. Donald <laughs> Trump thinks he's the underdog. Chappelle thinks he's the underdog. Elon Musk thinks he's the underdog. Taylor Swift described herself as canceled. So when you're in a world where these people see themselves as the victim or as the underdog, what is this metric about punching up, punching down? You know, how useful can it be? Sean, I'd love to get your response to that. But th th after that, I think to Jason's point, we should probably move on from these guys to some of the less well-known uh, comics we're going to be talking about today. But yeah, Sean, go ahead and follow up on that. No, I, I actually agree. I agree with that. Uh, like the dichotomy of like good comedy punches, you know, punches up, and, and it's like that's never been the case. But I think the the degree to which punching down has become a lot of people's like identity in comedy is an issue. Specifically with like something like with Chappelle, it's like you dedicated like four straight specials to this trans joke issue that you have, and you have, and your and his his like ideology has not progressed one bit like it's still just the same types of jokes and the the the, uh, the whole idea behind him even doing trans jokes at this point is now is like you can't tell me i can't make fun of trans people because i make fun of everybody and it's like but like you're act you don't even have a real perspective on it like you know like it, like it's just it's so boring it's so incredibly boring and so it's like it's not even so much that you're punching down it's like you're you're not even punching down like it's like if you're gonna punch down at least like Throw a good punch, you know what I mean? It's like it's, it's just you're just wasting everybody's time, you know. It's like it's like I mean, if 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 if, if George Foreman is is, is going to fight Gary Coleman, you better punch him across the room, clean across the room. Like you know, what I, mean? I, I don't want to like I don't want to just knock him over. Like punch him through a wall. Like 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 make something happen here. Like it's not it's just not exciting. And, he, and, and the idea that he thinks it's still exciting and it's it, he he'll do this like very. It, it, it sounds like. Who am I to criticize Chappelle as the level stand up I am? But it's like, it's he's so good that it's so disappointing when he do, he'll do a thing where he'll kind of like frame this joke as like, I'm about to do a great joke or I'm about to trick you. And then he'll do and like, well, this is actually a really boring joke, but you just set it up as like, I'm doing something that no one's ever done before. So then it, it just, you kind of get away with it because you're Dave Chappelle. But if I saw somebody at like an open mic do that same joke, I'm like, well, this is, this is not an interesting take. It's mm. just, I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> Punch up, punch down, but it's like just 
like be a precise puncher maybe you know what i mean like be like throw some have throw some power punches all right so we're gonna uh, shift from there to somebody that maybe is a little less well known i have to say that i heard of this guy i heard uh, mike peska interview him i didn't i never actually watched uh, gary goldman um he's got a new special on hbo called born on third base i'm guessing at some point it was called look mom uh but uh, here's a, a little bit this is a one cat of gary goldman i used to think they called it a pop tart because it popped out of the toaster. No, pop is short for populist. (laughs) It's the poor man's tart. I'm gonna use an, an analogy to clarify this. The, the tart is to the pop tart as the grizzly bear is to the Gummy bear. (laughs) That's a really strong analogy. And the irony of me coming up with such an apt analogy is that I flunked out of analogy school. And flunking out of analogy school is like... So that's Gary Goldman. Um, uh, Jason and I hadn't um, seen him before. I I was really kind of bowled over by what he's doing and and what he's doing there. In some ways, that's a representative clip. In other ways, that it's it's not. He sometimes will talk for... I didn't have a stopwatch on him, but it seems like he'll he'll talk pretty straight and seriously for about two minutes to kind of set up a theme. Uh, A lot of his themes in this special have to do with the fact that he, in fact, grew up poor. Uh, But there's a lot of other things that he talks about that are relatively serious subjects, and he doesn't mind talking about them pretty seriously, uh, giving a little sermon, a little unitarian sermon about them first before he goes into them. Uh, And there's a thoughtfulness about a lot of the comedy that I think is kind of the opposite of what we were just talking about with with Gervais uh, and Chappelle. But uh, Jason, you're the critic. Let's hear what you think. Yeah, Gary Goldman's one of the best stand-up comedians of the past 30 years. He, he has a huge backlog of great specials. I highly recommend his previous one was called The Great Depression, which uh, is about his, his you know, de- depression he had. He, he's, I think he, he was on, he was a regular on Letterman when he was on. This, uh, the thing that, you know, you hear in that clip, um, there's a kind of precision with his la- use of language and a command of the way he like you listen to that last joke and how he is either uh, ahead of the audience, like he speaks this fast clip or he'll slow down to a point where he lets the audience fill in the punchline. He doesn't even need to finish that point about the analogy. And there's a real, and, and you and you can get some of the biggest laughs from that when the audience fills in the blank. Um, he's had some bits. Um, there's one, you know, thing that a lot of comedians think you've talked to comedians on like the greatest standup bits of the last 50 years. There's one on state capitals on how, on how you abbreviated state capitals that people should Google greatest. Yeah. You know, well, what, one of the greatest, most intricate bits ever done. Um, this new one is obsessed with class and the inequities of class in America and how the gap when when he was um, young was uh, much smaller than it is now. And, um, you know, speaking of, you know, sort of punching up, punching down, the the uh, Goldman is often, first of all, in, in the previous special, he did a whole bit defending um, like millennials and Gen Z uh, as being sensitive and snowflakes, which is the kind of thing you often hear from people like Ricky Gervais or Dave Chappelle. So like what was actually transgressive is hearing a person the exact same age as them try to articulate a good defense, whether he believes it or not, who cares? But it's more interesting to hear a middle aged guy make that defense. In this case, he's talking about the the issues of class and he uses the metaphor of the stand up world where the stand up world is as messed up about this as the the broader economy in the sense that we spend so much time that the one percent in stand up you know, Chappelle, Seinfeld, Gervais get so much attention and the vast, you know, the other 99% get so little attention. And that's not a reflection of how good they are or how, you know, how, how productive they are or any other metric. 
Um, and he uses the the metaphor of comedy. He talks about Seinfeld and he talks about, you know, Seinfeld is the sign. You know, he talks about how Seinfeld's a billionaire and compares his wealth and, and says, you know, is he as, um, you know, how much better a comic is he than I am? And that joke he makes that you hear about Pop-Tarts, I, I took um, as also kind of uh, uh, a little bit of a dig because Seinfeld's most famous joke which he's making a movie uh, about for Netflix like, series about pop tarts. Um, so the fact that Gary Goldman sort of says Gary Goldman says, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna one up him on on a pop tart joke," is uh, is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, but yeah, I highly recommend um, checking out this new this this new special. So Sean, you're uh, you've been aware of Goldman for a really long time. Uh, I get the feeling based on what I was told by the producer that this is maybe not your favorite Gary Goldman special. I don't have anything to compare it, compare it to. Yeah, it's it's not my favorite uh, just because around the time of uh, the Great Depression, uh, which is his previous special, he was going through a lot, uh, you know, psychologically and emotionally. And he put out the Great Depression, which is like sort of a um, at the time, he was just a pure joke writer, like prior to that, like, you know, like it was just like like the abbreviations uh, uh, bit was in the, the special previous to that one. And like he didn't really have a, like a um, like a an emotional component to his standard. Like he didn't really bring that to the stage in the same way. The Great Depression was very like um it, it was it was it was it was exploring where he was at his, where where he was in his life at the time more than any of his any of his previous material, which was kind of just like, you know, an all over, you know, widespread look at just whatever. Um and I feel like uh this one kind of carries a little bit over that that um that energy over like the jokes are he still writes great jokes but it's um it feels like like you said about how he he'll set up a bit for a long time like in a sort of somber way he didn't do that as much anymore i do i, th I don't necessarily think that's like a a failure of his i feel like it's something that as you grow as a comedian you sort of your approach to how you write jokes is going to change and also he's developed enough of a reputation as a stand-up where he can get like not get away with that because i don't want to say like it's a, it's a something that he shouldn't be doing but it's more like a um He's allowed the permission and the uh, the grace from the audience to set up a bit like that because we trust that it's going to end up in a uh, in a special place like that. Analogy, uh, <laughs> I love how he ends that. Like it's such a perfect way to end that joke. It's so smart. And I love what I love about Goldman is that he is very, he's clearly very smart and he I think he's like one of the best wordsmiths we've ever had in comedy. But I, I feel like there's a lot of other wordsmith type comedians that I could think of, like, uh, I can think of, like, Mike Kaplan, where it's, like, Mike Kaplan is very smart about words, but he also feels like he's trying very hard to make you think that he's smart about words, whereas Goldman, he'll even, he'll, like, undercut his intelligence in that same bit, but, like, when he says, you know, flunking out of analogy school is, like, it's, like, like, you know, he doesn't even have the word for it, like, it's, he's not, he's smart, but he doesn't, like, he's not, he doesn't think he's smarter than the audience, he's conveying an idea about words and how he thinks about them, but it never feels like he's trying to, like, show like I, ch check out how smart i am i studied this word and i'm gonna do a tongue twister or whatever it's like no it's just like this is a funny way to look at this this how we how we speak mm. yeah we're gonna take a little break here uh this uh, hour is going very very fast and we've got a lot of other comedians we want to talk about so let's take that break we'll come right back We're back with Sean Murray, stand-up comedian, host of the Nobody Asked Sean podcast, Jason Zinneman, critic at large for the New York Times, where he writes the On Comedy, uh, the on comedy column. Um, we're going to have to skip over some of the comedians we were plan to, planning to talk about just uh, for the sake of time. But I, I do want to say, sadly, that a comedian we probably won't have too much time to discuss, Kenny DeForest, uh, died in a bicycle uh, accident uh, fairly recently. Uh, but his work is very, very interesting. It's also weird to kind of contrast it with Gary Goldman. Goldman's 6'6", six, six, I think, DeForest was 6'4". They both were basketball players who do basketball material, which is just like an odd little coincidence. But I think we really ought to move on to some of the women who are doing interesting things this year. Let's start with a comedian named Dina Hashem, uh, and let's hear a little bit from her special, This is A2, Cat. It's also weird to think that there was a slogan for 9-11. <laughs> 
That didn't just happen organically. It didn't just start appearing everywhere. There had to be like a marketing meeting, right? I just like to imagine that meeting with like politicians and marketing people. And one marketer is like, okay, I think I got it. 9-11, never forget. And that crushes, right? <laughs> Everyone's like, that's good. <laughs> that's somber, that's timeless, that's respectful. But I don't know, are there any alts? Can we get some alts, variations on 9-11, never forget? Something similar but different? And someone's like, yeah, how about 9-11, unforgettable? <laughs> almost the same. <laughs> but now it kind of sounds like a rave review. <laughs> this is a tragedy, not a tour de force performance. So Jason, um, this is my t first time watching her. Um, her, as uh, Donald Trump would say, her low energy uh, style of delivery. But I found it off-putting at first. And then you realize there's this fairly intense and very interesting mind at work behind these uh, jokes, but uh, her self presentation. I don't know. You see so much comedy, maybe less, th fewer things probably surprise you. But I was surprised that she could get by just with, with so little energy. I mean, that being, I think, part of the joke that she's not going to put a lot of energy into these jokes. Yeah, there is a, like a, a, a sub genre of stand up. One I like a lot um, that is this, that has this sort of deadpan uh you know low energy style people like i mean the kind of the the top of the family tree would be like uh, stephen wright and mitch hedberg and then you know the you have people like you know todd berry um you know er early in his career hannibal burris i put in this category although i think he sped up i'm sure sean can name a lot more um than me the uh um, it was that she uh, is firmly in this this kind of deadpan tradition and she's someone who you know, I've been seeing kill and clubs for a long time, but, you know, as you suggest, it, it's a little, it's sometimes it can be tough to translate that um, to a special. Um, and so, and it can be sometimes harder for those kind of, I've seen a lot of really, really funny comics who have this style um, have trouble breaking through. Um, but I mean, I, you know, Dina Hashim is, is a fantastic joke writer. And I mean, that, the joke you just played, it's that's also like there's a great tradition of like jokes about that go back to like you know Lenny Bruce and and Bob Newhart of like you know ad, put, putting uh putting you, you in an advertising meeting for things like you know things from the Bible or things from things from uh very solemn things and uh that that's a great addition to that that genre and so that that special which is on prime I mean she's she's the example of somebody she got a, a pretty sharp pointed Jeff Bezos joke in a special on uh, Jeff Bezos website, Prime. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think I think she says when she tells that joke, uh, this, if this winds up on Prime, we'll, we'll just cut that or they'll cut it or something. <laughs> and then it's, it's on Prime and, and she she leaves it in. Sean, what are your thoughts about Dina Hashem? I think Dina Hashem is great. I remember um, I think one of the reasons why she's able to she, she has been able to break through in a way that a lot of like sort of kind of understated performers that are just very sharp joke writers, but don't bring a lot of energy is because Dina really like, um, like cut her teeth, especially in the, um, the roast battle scene in New York city. And she was one of the best roasters, uh, in the, in that scene. And like, it, there's so much energy in those rooms, but her joke writing was always so precise and cutting that like people would quiet down to hear her. Like she 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 has such a great um control of a room where she can um uh like she she's not like she's never gonna try to like make you uh or just try to like reach out to you. She's like she's gonna make you come to her, like play at her level. You know what I mean? And I think one of the things she does really well too is that she writes about a lot of dark subjects, but she doesn't ever feel to me at least that she's trying to be edgy for the sake of edginess. Like a lot of people do 9-11 jokes these days. And it's just because 9-11 is such a, uh, or it's like same way like when people like like name drop like the Holocaust or, or Hitler, where it's like, it's, it's like, this is the worst thing. And it's like, you know, it stings to bring this up. So I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to reference it in a flippant way. And I think she approaches it where it's like, it's not, it's, it's more about like, similar to how Goldman likes to look at like how we, 
how we talk about things. It's like how how like how did this become? How, how did it? Uh, how did this happen? You know, what I mean? how do we, how do we the way we look at nine eleven? How it, how it's framed? And, and and you get a, a good joke off, but it doesn't feel like it's at the expense of the experience of living through nine eleven, which I think a lot of people often uh, rely on. So I think it's a pretty easy transition, and I'm sorry for speed dating through all these people, but a pretty easy transition from her to, her to the comedian Beth Stelling. Uh, Beth Stelling, uh, in terms of energy, is maybe one rung up uh, from what we were talking about, but also not exactly somebody who kind of screams out her material. Uh, her new special is called If You Didn't Want Me. Uh, it's not that new. It hit Netflix in October. Um, so, uh, so Jason, tell I know you like Beth Stelling, so tell us a little bit about what you like about her. Um, you know, she she's a comic who's been good for a long time, um, but I think really kind of jumped to class with this last special. She, you know, on the surface, it seems like she's more of a storyteller, but there's, you know, there's a ton of jokes that she integrates into her stories that it never goes too far without um, a laugh. And, you know, the um, this the, the, I would say to the, to the question of like transgression, there's two, two of her big set pieces are about you know, relationships of wild age differences, you know, that, that would be wildly inappropriate, but that she makes um, really funny at the, but at the, at the core of her act, um, first of all, is, is an incredibly well-defined character. She like, for, for me, when I remember listening to this, I wrote about this. She reminded me of, uh, like so much of my best friend from high school. Uh, and she has this kind of like steely persona. That's very, that I think a lot of that a lot of people can recognize, and so she begins with this, and then from that, um, she, you can go to all kinds of really idiosyncratic places. So her new special is really about, I think, her relationship with her mom, um, and her her previous special on HBO Max is the relationship with her dad, and and there's moments that are always funny, it never gets maudlin, but that are kind of emotional, and there's a kind of um, uh, almost like a she sort of takes revenge for her mom in one of these jokes. But um, anyhow, I, I, I highly recommend her. All right. And uh, Sean, I think you have some fairly similar things to say. Yeah. One of the things I like about Beth uh, is that, um, like Jason said, it's like she's you, she, you would think she's a storyteller, but like she actually like most of her stories don't actually even go on that long. Like she, or she or she doesn't like tell this full arc of this. She'll just start telling a story and then just stop and focus on this one little joke, you know, that's just like it's it's just like. It almost, if you if you were to describe her act, you would feel like she was leaving a lot of meat on the bone with some of these topics. But she actually covers all that she's interesting about it, interested about with these things, and then she moves on to the next thing, and you never feel like okay, like, like she has such a great perspective on stuff and such a wacky sort of like all over the place. Like she's like she's not super big in terms of her energy, but like her mind is very like like uh, wacky where she's like uh, like oh, that's an interesting way to you know think think about that but she never like belabors it and she moves on and gets to something else you never feel like oh I wonder, I wonder what else she had to say about that you, you like her mind is moving so fast that like she's already on to the next thing and you just you're just wanting to catch up you don't feel like oh no no go back to that because you you, you, you kind of left something on the bone there I, I think she's such a a great uh writer and performer in that way because she she blends those two things really well where it's like a lot of her jokes she she, she can get across just from a, a, a look on her face, but also she's a very strong writer. Yeah, I, I do have to say uh, that the two pieces from this special, uh, the story that generates uh, ultimately the title of the special, and I won't say anything more about it than that, is really tremendous, and particularly coming to that particular title is very, very funny. And then, I mean, the one that I think is very transportable is the whole thing about her uh, father feeding raccoons. Uh, and that's, you know, that does go on for a bit, but yeah, I think you're right, Sean, she probably has another five minutes worth of stuff and let me just say, I have never fed raccoons, but I have been very, very close to someone who fed raccoons, and it's pretty easy to get 20 of them out on your deck. I mean, sure. they, the word spreads around. <laughs> I uh, wouldn't and, guess. And, and there's 20 of them out, out, out on the deck really easily. And then there's the one who comes later and goes, in this rac one raccoon is out there by himself, and he's kind of like, is this, I, I heard that this place... You could get food here, like it's free, right? <laughs> That's what, I heard it was free. You could just come here, um, but we uh, we probably should move on. I 
I'm so out of it that I'm, I'm probably 2023 was the year of Taylor Tomlinson. I just didn't happen to know that. So I think 2024 is the year of Taylor Tomlinson. Uh, but this is a, uh, a young comedian. I think she's 30 years old right now uh, who is going to take over the James Corden spot uh, on late night television. Uh, but she's also got just a tremendous comedy special out right now. I was just bowled over by this. Uh, so this is going to be B1 Cat. Let's hear a little bit from Look at You, the Taylor Tomlinson Netflix special. I thought I was on an antidepressant. It turns out I'm not. It turns out I'm actually on a mood stabilizer that they use as an antidepressant. Fun fact about prescription drugs. Everything they prescribe, they actually use for like four different things. So you don't really know what your deal is (laughs) until you find a combo that works and then Google all your pills by yourself. So after years of trial and error, I finally found a combination of things that worked for me. And six months ago, I decided to Google it, because what the hell? And it turns out that everything I'm taking is primarily used for bipolar disorder. So I went back to my psychiatrist, and I was like, hey. (laughs) Do we think? (laughs) And she was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, is this how you tell people? (laughs) She's like, no, of course not. We didn't know. I'm glad we figured it out. And I was like, we? (laughs) I said, you really didn't know that I was bipolar. And she goes, no, of course not. We thought we were treating anxiety and depression. And I said, okay, because this kind of feels like a putting your dog's medication in cheese situation. Uh, a little bit later in that bit, bit too, she talks about how she was kind of offended by the fact that her friends weren't surprised when they heard about that diagnosis. And that what, one thing they said is, you know what? That kind of connects some dots for us. Um, <laughs> so, Jason, you have your doctorate in Taylor Tomlinson. Um, you've really spent some time studying her, following her, uh, interviewing her, chronicling this kind of rise that she's going through. I should say that special was from 2022. There's going to be a new one this year. But just, I don't know, bring us up to date on Taylor Tomlinson. It, it feels like yeah, you, it's a name people are going to really need to know this year. Yeah, you're you're not out of date at all. You're spot on. This is, this is the moment for her right now, not last year. She's next week. She starts on this late night show. And then the following month is when her third Netflix special comes out, which is remarkable for, you know, someone who just turned 30 to have three Netflix specials. Um, and uh, this Sunday, I've, you know, I've, I've spent the last 10 months uh, reporting on her for a story that originally was going to be following like an evolution of this one joke, a closer of her special. And so I would go to see a show and then we'd debrief about it because she's sort of a technician with jokes. So I thought she'd be a good a good uh, a model for that. But then when she got this late night show, we sped it up. So the uh, the piece is uh, coming up uh, on Sunday. Um, but yeah, she's this, you know, stand up is a little bit like uh, gymnastics in that the people who are the superstars a disproportionate number of them started really young. If you look at, you know, Chappelle, Eddie Murphy, Adam Sandler, they started incredibly young, 14, 15, 16. Um, Taylor Tomlinson is one of those people. She started uh, when she was 16 and she, uh, by all accounts, was was good right off the bat and started um, in churches. She started in the church circuit. And one of the things that was uh, yeah, I'm, I'll keep this brief because I can't go on for about this. But the uh, one of the things that I learned, which was interesting, is that when I heard that she started in churches th- as a teenager, I thought, oh, small, you know, 100 seat room, whatever. No, these are big churches. These are, <laughs> she was playing thousands seat rooms as a teenager, um, which, you know, is incredible practice for where she is now, which is as, you know, a theater borderline arena t- uh, a performer. Um, so, uh, you know, in the piece, I think uh, I talked to Hannah Einbinder, who's another talented young comedian, um, who, you know, compared her to Taylor Swift, sort of the Taylor Swift of comedy. And there are some, there are some superficial, uh, similarities, although she's obviously not that big, but, uh, this is, this is the moment. And, you know, it's interesting choice that she decided to do a talk show. Um, but, uh, in a time when I think the power of the talk show is diminished, um, there was a time, you know, a few decades ago when that was the pinnacle, uh, that was the job that everybody wanted. 
Um, and uh, I still think it's very, it's a big deal job, no question. Um, but I would be surprised if she's doing this show. It's 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 not a traditional talk show, but it's a it's a show where they'll have like three comedians on every day making kind of topical jokes. Um, but uh, she, yeah, she she she's a, a incredibly good joke writer, um, and um, and and it will be interesting to see where she goes from here. Right. Uh, we should say, Sean, you started also very very young. Um, I, I you go wherever you want about Taylor Tomlinson. One thing I want to quickly want to say is that the end of Goldman special, he talks about very sincerely. I think about the fact that not do the people don't just like his jokes; they seem to like him, and that means a lot to him. Um, uh, not every comedian is likable, uh, but I found with Taylor Tom Tomlinson, even though she comes across as this kind of edgy, hot mess, um, th- th- just there's something about her. I thought I bet it would be fun to have lunch with Taylor Tomlinson. I, I, I bet she'd be kind of a fun friend to have. Uh, I could be very wrong about that, but go wherever you want to go about her. Uh, well, first, I would just like to say I, I just was kind of offended when I read Jason's piece about when Hannah Einbender called her. The Taylor Swift. I always thought I was the Taylor Swift of comedy, <laughs> but that's just, I guess we all have a different perspective on Justin on, Bieber. You know, everyone, Justin Bieber. Yeah. I'll, I'll be a Bieber. Uh, <laughs> no, I, um, I, I think um, what you said about her personality is is actually why it's interesting. Why like, it makes perfect sense why they, like she's, um, she, she, she won the spot of the host of After Midnight because she has that affability that you would exactly, the exact type of affability that you want in that role of the of the host of that show. But like the original version, like which was at midnight, which was on Comedy Central, was hosted by Chris Hardwick, who um has been in comedy for a long time, but I, I don't think he's as strong a comic as um no. as as Taylor by any stretch. And, and that's why I think it's interesting that like it it always feels like to me that um when you're a stand up and then you get that role as the late night host or like that kind of like desk job, it kind of like diminishes what you bring as a state. Like you, you kind of have to like soften your edges a little bit to be not that she's like the, you know, she was, you know, she's uh, Lenny Bruce, but she, she like, there's a, a level of like, um, I feel like you lose a little bit, but you also gain a lot in terms of like you become a household name or potentially or whatever. And you can sort of like solidify your, uh, your bottom line, I guess, in a sense, I'm interested to see what that does for her in terms of like, because of where we are with the, the late night landscape, it's like it doesn't mean what it used to. And it, um, I feel like she could have a lot more power, uh, like uh, control her c- yeah. career uh, m- by not being kind of sucked into the CBS Viacom, uh, you know, <laughs> machine. But also it's like, I, I, who would turn down that gig? Right. So we're going to have to go to another break here, unfortunately. I do want to say that in Jason's articles about her, she says stand-up is going to come first. It's going to, it's going to take prominence or preeminence over, um, uh, over the late-night gig. She also is very interesting the way she talks about hard work. She talks about it in Jason's article, and it's all over her special, too, about how hard she works. You didn't work as hard uh, as I work, and that may help her a lot uh, doing any kind of daily show. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back, maybe talk about what these two guests are looking forward to in 2024. And we are back. The technical producer of today's show is Kat Pastor. The producer of the episode is Jonathan McPants. Senior producer is Lily Tyson. Uh, with us today, Sean Murray, stand-up comedian, writer, and host of the Nobody Asked Sean podcast. Jason Zinneman, critic at large for the New York Times, where he writes the On Comedy column. So we just have about five or six minutes left here. Uh, Jason, maybe you can go first. Uh, m- maybe mention one or two things that you're looking forward to in 2024 on the comedy front. Uh, well, there's so many things. So I'll just, uh, I think Kurt, the, la- the last season of Curb Your Enthusiasm is probably a thing I'm most excited about seeing. Um, I'm sad that it's ending, um, but I really want to uh, see how Larry David uh, you know, does, makes the landing. Um, I think uh, the, um, you know, I'm actually interested in the uh, Amy Poehler, Tina Fey uh, tour. Um, which uh, is is going around the country, and I assume will, will at some point be a special. Um, I'm interested in uh, Rory Scovel's new special, which is coming out in February. Who's a really talented comedian, and I also a little bit of wild card. I think like the the comic who's actually dominating conversation this year is not uh, Taylor Tomlinson or Dave Chappelle. 
it's uh, Cat Williams uh, because of an interview he gave to Shannon Sharp where he just talked an epic amount of trash. And Cat Williams is an incredible stand-up comedian, and he has the spotlight on him now like he probably <laughs> never has before. And I would be surprised if he didn't do something with that. And uh, so I'm actually like, really eager to see what Cat Williams does um, in, in the stand-up field. Um, he's incredibly prolific, and I, I'm sure Netflix is is dying for him to release something this year. All right, Sean, you've got the floor. Yeah, I, I second the the Cat Williams thing. I think he does have a special. I think he mentioned it in the uh, the Shannon Sharp thing. I think he has one coming. I think maybe April or May. Uh, I'm excited to see what John Mulaney's doing next uh, because he seems to be like he just has not stopped touring, <laughs> even from the From Scratch tour, which became Baby J. Like I feel like immediately he had. A ton of other dates, like right after that special came out, and he's been touring the whole year. Can I just, just sure jump in? And, I, can I just jump in and say, for me, Baby J was the comedy special. I mean, I didn't see, I don't see as much stuff as you two guys do, but of what I saw, I thought Baby J was a, a work of genius, and that really had me laughing very, very, very hard at certain points. But anyway, Sean, you have the floor. Clearly, you were not a Golden Globes voter because they <laughs> gave it to Ricky Gervais. I know. Uh, they don't, I don't think he's even nominated. He wasn't even nominated oh for, a, for a Golden Globe. Yeah. The worst choice. Mm. The worst. I can't. Uh, it's unconscionable that that mm. that is the best special of the year from that the Golden Globes. It, wasn't even, it was a pretty bad selection of nominees too. But I don't even want to get into that. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder what. I wonder what's happening with uh, like John Mulaney who did the sack lunch bunch, which I loved a yes. few years ago, and then he was supposed to do more, and then obviously the rehab and everything happened. So I don't know what's happening, but I would love to see if, if that's happening. There's a couple of comics who are like sort of on the cusp, like coming up that I, I would like to see. Like um, uh, JP McDade is a comic I really love. He's originally from Connecticut. He's in New York. He's uh, just recorded a special through Stavros Halkis, uh, who um, produced it. And uh, it should be coming this year. I'm very excited for that. Uh, Napoleon Emilio is a great stand-up from New York City. I want to see what he's doing this year. Um... It was another comic. Uh, yeah, Doye Travis is a great co- stand-up comic. I want to see what he's doing this year. And um, Sam J is the other I'm one. I'm really on your excited list. to see what happens. What's up? Sam J was the another one on your list. Oh yeah, Sam J. I think Sam J had a, a good, a really good year last year. She's been doing stuff with HBO. She had a uh, she had the HBO special, but she also had that show Pause with Sam J, which is like a basically a hangout with a bunch of comedians. I want to see. I feel like she's like the next. She's like ready to hit that next level of like household name comic and i'm really excited uh i saw i used to see sam j back in boston years ago and i was like kind of see her go to snl and then like hit this level is, is amazing and uh i'm really excited to see what the just back to taylor thompson with, with after midnight uh becomes like I, I i always loved one of the things i love about late night is that um it was just it was always a great platform for young stand-ups to get an opportunity to, to display their talents to the nation and i wonder if that's going to be obviously there's going to be a bunch of like already established comics that are going to be on that panel for the first few months. But I wonder if it's going to become an opportunity for uh, younger stand-ups to get, like, you know, go on there and get some jokes off. Right. Uh, we're, we're launching our campaign to get Sean Murray on After Midnight uh, as soon as possible. I just want to quickly end by thanking these two guests. I also want to say one thing about Ricky Gervais, which is I, I didn't, I did really detested this uh, special that he just did. But Ricky Gervais, you look at it as something like Afterlife, the series that he did about a small town newspaper. I, there's so much humanity in there that is so absent from his stand-up comedy. It's just amazing. I, I do recommend that going back and l- watching Afterlife, which also stars uh, Diane Morgan, who's gone on to be, of course, Philomena Kunk, who's a whole other kind of comedy pleasure. But thanks to both of these two wonderful guests, uh, Sean Murray and Jason Zinneman. Thanks to everybody who listened. Thanks to McPants. Thanks to Kat. We gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> it's cozy. <laughs> like a Cracker Barrel. Yeah, we all be laughing, talking, joking, talking about this and talking about that. And talk about everything as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. Talk about Torrington, Vernon, Danbury, Waterbury, Oliveberry, Woodbury, hitting on New Britain, Vernon, I already said that one, Avon, Farmington. Yeah, 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 yeah.